Hi, I'm Dr. Carl Sabatki, and I'm excited to talk today about the topic of image resolution and radiology deep learning. Now, uh, this talk is gonna have a general approach, but I'm also gonna heavily touch on a paper uh, that I published in 2020 with Dr. Bradley Spieler of LSU uh, in the RSNA's Radiology Artificial Intelligence Journal which is entitled The Effective Image Resolution on Deep Learning in Radiography. This article also has some great commentary that was written by Dr. Paris Lakani. So if you'd like, you can potentially read this paper before you watch the rest of this talk or afterwards, it might be helpful as well. And I'll also be referencing several other papers uh, on AI throughout the talk that are definitely worth reading, perhaps even more than my own paper. So I've decided to break this talk into four parts. The first part is gonna review deep learning fundamentals and some model variants. The second part is gonna kind of deep dive into contrast and spatial resolution concepts in radiology. The third part, I'm gonna talk about uh, the intermixing of image resolution concepts and AI in radiology, uh, where I'm gonna talk about that paper of mine that I mentioned a decent amount. And then the fourth part, I'm gonna kind of just go through a GitHub repo of a recent neural network that I was working on. I think it's important to kind of see how, you know, to do this yourself if you're not already practicing AI or a computer programmer. Um, so I've got a pretty simple Jupyter notebook on GitHub that I'm gonna just walk through and then touch on some of the concepts that we're gonna talk about in the other preceding three parts. So for part one, let's talk about some deep learning. So speaking of the fundamentals, we can't get more basic than reviewing the basic data inputs and outputs that we'll be dealing with uh, with neural network models. So at the basic level, uh, I like to think of most of what we are currently calling AI is simply arbitrary function approximation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. But what I mean by this is that given a tensor, we can use an AI model to transform this tensor into another tensor. Uh, back in college physics courses, I remember the tensor math seemed a little scary because I knew that meant that I have to do a lot of test problems, working things out by hand with pen and paper. Uh, but in 2020, no one should be afraid of tensors. Uh, we have computers, um, and even if you don't have much of a formal math background, uh, it's really simple enough to think of tensors as just generalizations of matrices or vectors, um, as the term tensor encapsulates all of these. Uh, so a tensor can be a scalar or a vector or a matrix or a collection of matrices. And so when you hear, like libraries like TensorFlow, just kind of think of it like that. Um, so, so this is a very useful construct in computer programming uh, as it can relate essentially directly to multidimensional arrays. Uh, for the purposes of radiology, we can say that our images are tensors uh, that we're using as inputs to neural networks. Um, then with a convolutional network, we convert these image inputs into arrays of diagnostic labels. Um, and so when I say an array of diagnostic labels, uh, I can, we can just think of a list of binary outputs, uh, which would affirm or deny the presence of pathology uh, within the image. Uh, so presence of absence of pneumonia, presence or absence of pneumothorax, et cetera. Now, as I mentioned before, the power of a neural network uh, is the ability to do something akin to arbitrary function approximation. So for that, we have the universal approximation theorem, um, if we want to get more formal with it, which is again, just the concept that an artificial neural network um, can basically take any set of inputs and map them to any functional output. Um, so we can take arbitrary images, and map them to labels that are pneumonia or not pneumonia, if we're specifically gonna be in the radiology mindset. Um, a neural net uh, is then essentially just a very large number of simple operations. So convolutions, batch norms, pooling, and nonlinear thresholding are the bread and butter of modern architectures. And with a large number of these simple operations and trading of the, these model weights uh, with something akin to gradient descent, we can teach a network to convert any data set of inputs into any arbitrary data set of outputs. Of course, in medicine and radiology, if we're not careful, then this isn't necessarily always a good thing, and we can get some misleading results, or we can overestimate uh, the power of our model. And by power, I really mean the generalizability. 
Another very fun architecture is generative adversarial networks. Uh, these are getting a lot of popular attention with deep fakes, uh, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, it, it's a very fun concept of rather than taking our tensor images and mapping them to a scalar or an array of kind of label outputs, what if we map our tensor input images to output images? Um, and the training of this is such that you can kind of uh, essentially change the appearance of images rather dramatically and in interesting ways. So you can have some, uh, this is from the, one of great papers on this um, for pix to pix uh, and cycle GANs out of this group at Berkeley where we, they had segmented scenes mapping to the raw images. They had kind of sky cams mapping to map views. Uh, there, there's tons of great examples of these um, and they're a very powerful uh, way of using neural networks. There's also the concept of using GANs for super resolution. So take one input image and map it to a higher res uh, output image. Uh, some of you might have thought this talk would be about super resolution GANs. And I have to apologize that although I'm mentioning them now, I'm not gonna get into too many details with those specifically. Uh, they do have applications in radiology for sure. Uh, but I'm going to kind of focus actually on more the, the low end of image resolution rather than super resolution for this talk. And then I just want to mention this. So one of the many great papers uh, in, in this uh, body of work is the ESR GAN paper here. Uh, so yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about is more silly just convolutional neural networks, uh, specifically the ResNet architectures uh, and the DenseNet architectures uh, is what I'm kind of going to focus on in this talk and how that relates to image resolution and how that factors into the field of radiology. Um, so some of the great papers here are Kaiming's uh, ResNet paper um, and the DenseNet paper, densely connected convolutional networks here. And these are kind of powerhouse architectures currently. Um, but the caveat is that recently Google's brain team uh, has published on the vision transformer network which might make a lot of what I'm saying less relevant in the future. Um, right now, as I'm recording this, it's at the top of the charts in terms of performance on ImageNet, and it has a really clever idea where it takes the transformer models from NLP, and it doesn't treat image inputs like they're actually images from a model architecture point of view. It breaks them down into patches and kind of treats those like you treat a word in an NLP uh, AI model. And the performance has been incredible, uh, but I must admit that although I've read their paper and it's great, uh, I haven't worked with them, these models, too much myself yet. So I'm also not going to talk too much about those beyond this mention of them in this talk. Um, I just kind of now, I've kind of put the cart before the horse in terms of talking about model variants before I talk about some of the basics. Uh, but if you're working in Python, specifically for training AI, then a lot of the two key libraries that come up are PyTorch and TensorFlow. I use both. PyTorch probably a little bit more than TensorFlow right now, but these are both excellent libraries for building your own neural networks. Then I've already mentioned ImageNet, but it's important to go over this critically important data set. So it's over 14 million images um, with synsets, which are cinema set labels. Um, they're kind of based on WordNet hierarchies of words. Uh, which were human annotated with crowdsourcing, so things like Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, this is a hugely important data set for benchmarking models. And uh, it's frequently used in transfer learning, so especially in, even in radiology, and especially in radiology, um, you know, it, it's very powerful to be able to take a model trained on 14 million images and then use the backbone of that model for an application where you might not have that many cases. So, for example, you know, you're trying to train a model in radiology for lysencephaly. Well, you hopefully don't have many cases of lysencephaly in your hospital's data system. Um, so it's really important to be able to train a model on a variety of image features, even if your actual end game target might not have that many data samples. And so training with basically models that have already been trained on ImageNet is very common practice. It's very effective. And so it's important, though, to think uh, in the concept of radiology of what is in ImageNet. Um, and so what, what I'm kind of getting to this to relate to the theme of this talk is that 
So ImageNet, actually, the images have a large variety of sizes, small to large. Um, but typically, uh, the models are trained that you might use for transfer learning on 224 by 224 uh, pixel resolution images or 256 by 256 pixel resolution images. Um, and these images look you know, rather different than what you'd expect to see as a particular radiology image. Another key data set that kind of helps bring home the point about thinking about the concept of image resolution, specifically low image resolution, are uh, the CIFAR data sets, or CIFAR, let's just say. Um, so there's CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. And so these are 60,000 uh, image data sets. They're 32 by 32 pixel images um, with a variety of classes. And this data set is still used for benchmarking. It's not used as much as ImageNet anymore. So in terms of image resolution, 32 by 32 pixels is quite small. And that actually means this is a great opportunity for us to transition to part two. Part two is contrast and space resolution in radiology. So as a jumping off point for this topic, I'm gonna use the ACR, AAPM, and SIM 2017 Technical Standard for Electronic Practices of Medical Imaging, which has a specific section dedicated uh, to display equipment specifications. Um, so they say in this technical standard, they expect 8-bit graphic depth in three color channels, red, green, blue, so 256 values each. Um, they expect the use of LCD or OLED panels, um, but they recommend against specifically using twisted nematic pixel structures, which can be found in cheaper LCD units. And they recommend that when you're changing the image size when going from the acquisition uh, image to the displayed image that you use um, at least four pixels around, uh, around for the interpolation. And they specifically recommend the cubic spline or cubic polynomial uh, methods of interpolation. So to talk a little bit more about this 2017 technical standard, um, they recommend classifying monitors based on pixel pitch and display size rather than total number of pixels, um, such as three megapixels or 10 megapixels, as you might see things advertised. Um, and so pixel pitch is the maximum spatial frequency that can be presented. Uh, with pitch in millimeters, uh, the maximum spatial frequency is one over two times the pitch, uh, with the unit being cycles per millimeter. And then if you're standing 60 centimeters away from a screen, so about two feet if you're using not the metric system for how you think about measurements in your head, uh, then the human eye can perceive spatial frequencies up to 2.5 cycles per millimeter. So if we're going beyond that, uh, we're probably not gonna be actually even able to see it. Uh, and then pixel pitch is then recommended to be about 0 0.2 millimeters, uh, but not larger than 0 0.21 millimeters for the technical standard. So uh, if you might be familiar with this concept uh, in terms of line pairs per millimeter, um, this is probably, if you're an American uh, radiology resident, the only slide in this entire talk that has relevance to uh, board exam questions. Um, and so, th but these are important values to keep in mind. So the highest resolution modality is gonna be a screen film mammography at 15 line pairs per millimeter. Uh, average. Uh, digital mammography is about half that resolution at seven line pairs per millimeter average. Uh, and this is on the acquisition uh, side of things and not display. Uh, for digital radiography, typically we're probably looking about three line pairs per millimeter. Um, for CT, uh, we're well below that, uh, order of magnitude below digital mammography at 0 0.7 line pairs per millimeter. And then for MRI, it's about 0 0.3 line pairs per millimeter. Uh, this is kind of broad strokes uh, numbers to keep in mind. Um, and the kind of thing to remember for board exam type factors is 7, 3, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. Um, so yeah, so the three line pairs per millimeter relates to the 2.5 cycles per millimeter that we were just talking about uh, in terms of spatial frequency and pixel pitch. Um, and if we just say three line pairs per millimeter, then we're going to have six pixels per millimeter in order to have the line pairs because we need two pixels uh, to show a line pair. And then pixel spacing, uh, if we're pulling up our DICOM headers when looking at radiographs, it'll typically be between zero, be between 0 0.1 and 0 
millimeters per pixel. So uh, one thing uh, uh, that's kind of entertaining to me uh, is to compare this to uh, mobile phone cameras uh, to see kind of how far they've come. Uh, so this is my phone, so I know a bit more details about it. Uh, so Samsung S7 Active has a 12 megapixel rear camera, um, and so that'll take uh, 4,032 pixel by 3,024 pixel photos. The front camera is only 5 megapixel resolution, but that still will give you 2,592 uh, uh, pixels by 1,944 pixels uh, for your photos. Um, if you're an Apple aficionado, uh, which I have, uh, like Apple, a uh, reasonable amount, uh, well, then they've had a 12 megapixel camera uh, since the iPhone 6S. So with the technology in our pockets, uh, we can take relatively large pixel dimension photos. Mm -hmm. So let's compare those to our DICOM images for radiographs. So in this example image, uh, it was stored uh, with 12-bit grayscale values. So basically each pixel could range from 0 to 4,095, um, which is a point I'll highlight in a bit in contrast to the 8-bit RBG, which is actually 24-bit uh, pixels. Uh, in terms of the dimensions, it's 2,544 by 3,056. Obviously, this is going to change by your field of view, pixel spacing, um, multiple feet factors like that. Um, but this is about how large we would expect our acquisition uh, image to be in terms of pixel dimensions. Going back to noting the difference between the 12-bit grayscale um, in that DICOM and 24-bit color, on our monitors. So if we have 24-bit color, then we have three channels with eight bits each. Um, if we're just doing a typical gray scale image for a monitor, then it'll typically be eight bits and it'll be values from zero to 255. So for radiograph DICOMs, uh, we can have 12 bits uh, storage or greater. And so we'd we'll have to map these values potentially from a uh, higher range to a smaller range. And this means we need to kind of carefully consider contrast in this setting. So one of the great ways to think about this is with image histograms of the pixel values. So here's uh, an image, and here is the frequency with which each uh, value in the image has a given pixel value. And this is after already mapping it to an 8-bit grayscale which is kind of more in the range of what I would typically be using uh, as inputs to an AI model. Um, so if we're kind of dealing with AI model inputs in this way, we can think about things like histogram equalization. Um, so in this way, we kind of try to balance out uh, our image histograms. And uh, another great way to do this is with Clayhe, which is contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization. Um, and so as you can see, moving from the original image that was put into an 8-bit gray scale without kind of any real proper attention to the image contrast scale. And then this clay heat image, we can see uh, it's going to look different than it'll typically look in our packs, unless we're using a clay heat uh, function on our packs. Um, but we can really see contrast a lot better in this image. And that'll be helpful for letting neural networks pick up on different image features that we might want them to be sensitive to. Um, we won't be doing a good job of training our AI if the AI can't properly discern features um, that, because we've masked them based on the contrast changes in shifting our images uh, as inputs. So just to compare here, here's now our new uh, image histogram of the pixel values uh, for our clay image from what we showed before. So this brings us to part three which is going to be image resolution and radiology AI, which is also kind of the main topic of the talk. So uh, a good thing to kind of look at is kind of what images look like when they're low resolution. If we're kind of thinking about how to use kind of pre-existing uh, AI models for radiology AI. So I mentioned the SIFAR database, which has 32 by 32 pixel images as uh, its data. So if we take an x-ray from a DICOM and then convert it to a 32 by 32 pixel image, we get this, which wouldn't really be comfortable making a read off of, as I'm sure all those no one would. Uh, although it is worth pointing out that 
you know, so this patient has a mass. Um, but you can actually see that this is abnormal, even on a 32 by 32 pixel image. Same for the 64 by 64. Um, and then this 224 by 224 image, we can kind of see things more clearly, still not maybe as well as we'd like, but we're, we're at 224 by 224, we are still kind of getting to a resolution where we might feel comfortable uh, making the diagnosis, almost certainly not for a subtle pneumothorax or maybe even any pneumothorax or even a small pleural effusion, but we can start to see uh, the features more clearly in the image to the human eye. So uh, it's just kind of another size comparison when talking about these images, um, and what inputs we might be using uh, for our neural network to keep in mind what our neural network may or may not be sensitive to um, based on how we've basically pre-processed the image or convert the image from our DICOMs to uh, the neural network input tensors. Um, here's a 16 by 16 image, 64 by 64, 256 by 256, and then 512 by 512. And so again, some uh, diagnostic labels, we might be pretty comfortable assigning uh, at these 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 resolution images. Uh, others though, most likely not. So why we're kind of caring about looking at low resolution images uh, goes back to how we train neural networks. So we're gonna train neural networks by optimizing our loss functions and we're gonna need to create, uh, calculate the gradient to update the model parameters. Um, we're gonna do this in batches. So we're gonna take images and the group of images we use to calculate the gradient to update the model weights is gonna be done um, based on these batches, which are gonna be assigned a batch size uh, when we're coding up the neural network. So uh, this can be limited by the number of images that can fit in our GPU's memory. So if for each pixel, we're gonna have 24 bits, um, so three bytes, so basically one, let's say the, the color channel images, um, and then the image is 256 by 250 pixels, um, then each of our images itself, just the image alone, is going to be needing 196 kilobytes uh, in a GPU. But that's not quite how it works. Um, in order to kind of run this in the memory of our GPU, uh, we need to store the model parameters, which, you know, can be millions for resonance and dense nets alike. We're going to need to store optimizer variables, and we're going to need to store the intermediate calculations uh, which are the activation functions. So as we go through a forward pass or neural network, what the actual convolution, batch norm, nonlinear output results are will need to be stored um, depending on our algorithm in different ways. So uh, this can add up quickly and kind of start taxing our modern GPUs and older GPUs. So uh, my kind of current GPU that I use for a lot of my work is a 12 gigabyte uh, NVIDIA 1080 Ti. Uh, I'll soon be upgrading to the RTX 3090, which has 24 gigabytes. Um, and, but then a lot of still in use, relatively high performance GPUs um, have six to eight gigabytes uh, RAM. Um, so if we're not careful uh, and we have complicated models that need a lot of these intermediate uh, type calculations, then we can be having a lot of difficulty trying to train our models with high resolution images certainly not the acquisition resolutions that are coming off of some of our modern cell phone cameras. And so we can be stuck with low batch sizes. We don't always want the biggest batch size possible, but we do wanna have that flexibility. So basically we can get around this uh, with kind of a mini batch technique where we parallelize things and we use multiple GPUs, um, but that can strain resources um, and it can affect training time. So we do kind of, from a practical point of view, want to understand uh, what image resolution we truly need uh, in order to get accurate model predictions. Just because we have 12 megapixel cameras or we have uh, radiology images that are acquired um, in high pixel resolution, we really want to think carefully about what we actually need. Uh, we don't necessarily want to go ahead and acquire our radiology images at a lower resolution, but we want to be able to think about how we can model them and how we need to model them. And there would be some implications of being able to acquire uh, at lower resolution, but not necessarily with the radiograph modality. I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. So before we go too much farther, we need some data. Um, 
I've been having this talk of talking about things before data when data really needs to come first. Um, so what I used in my paper uh, with Dr. Spieler that was published in the RSNA's Radiology Artificial Intelligence Journal was the NIH's chest x-ray data set, um, which has 32,717 patients, 108,948 frontal chest radiographs, so it's only frontals, no laterals, and it has PNG or DICOMs available, and the PNGs are available as 1024 by 1024 pixel images, so not the acquisition uh, resolutions. They've been downsized and they've been resized, uh, which is an important thing to think about. At the time, this was the main data set. Now, though, there are some more, so I'll talk about them. Uh, but talk a little bit more about the NIH's data set. Uh, they don't have the original radiologist reports available. I can't uh, look up what the radiologist said and compare that to the label. Uh, what they did is they used NLP and extracted 14 different labels, and those are what we have to go on if we want to do AI with this data set right now. So those labels are atelectasis, cardiomegaly, effusion, infiltration, mass, nodule, pneumonia, pneumothorax, consolidation, edema, emphysema, fibrosis, pleural thickening, and hernia. And so there's definitely been some controversies about this label selection and how they relate, um, and as a result, when I've done modeling, I don't necessarily use all the labels here. Uh, as some can be kind of ambiguous, or you wouldn't necessarily want to penalize a neural network for saying one rather than the other when, you know, you typically give a differential for that label in a clinical setting. So some of the newer uh, data sets that we now have, if we want to use public data for chest radiograph AI, is Chexpert um, from the Stanford group from Dr. Ng, uh, Jeremy Irvin, Pranav Rajperkar. Uh, so this is a 65,240 patient data set. Uh, there are 224,316 chest radiographs as frontals and laterals. Uh, so that's an important consideration when comparing the data sets. And it also has 14 labels, but they're different. Uh, so one of them is no finding. Uh, and a caveat here is the x-rays don't need to have a label. They can have multiple labels, but they can also have no labels. So no finding is not the same as no label. Uh, so it's more of a hard or negative in the context of this data set. So the other ones are enlarged cardiomediastinum, cardiomegaly, which obviously they chose to kind of be able to compare those two, lung lesion, lung opacity, edema, consolidation, pneumonia, atelectasis, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pleural other, fracture and support devices. And again, we can kind of see uh, some inner relations with these labels, which, you know, I just pulled the first page of their paper as I've kind of been doing for this screenshot, but, you know, they're, they're kind of showing how lung opacity, uh, they're considering the multiple possibilities that fall under that hierarchical category. Same thing with enlarged cardiomediastinum and cardiomegaly. We don't expect to see one without the other, necessarily. Um, and then an important consideration here is that they have a standard data download um, as available as a more lightweight version of the data set, and it rescales to 320 by 320 pixel images. So the final data set that I'm going to talk about for chest radiograph AI is Mimic CXR, and I really, really like this data set um, from uh, MIT and Harvard collaboration because it includes the radiology report text. Uh, they did some great work doing uh, anonymization and PHI removal that they could actually include the radiology report text for uh, the public. Uh, so this is 65,379 patients, 227,835 imaging studies, and then 377,110 images. Um, this is, I really can't stress enough how useful it is to have the report text because then you don't need to work on pre-existing or pre-made labels. You can create your own labels and then you can go back and if you think the AI uh, might be right when your labels are saying it's wrong. You can go back, review the text, review the image yourself, and kind of see if it's a problem with how it was labeled based on the report, or maybe it's a problem with your labeling system that you're using for your automated labeling, if you're using automated labeling. So it's incredibly useful to have the original radiology reports with redacted PHI in the data set. So let's kind of uh, go back to another reason why it's so great to have the report text because 
different. Uh, so if we're using binary labels, that's great, but not all clinical pathology is truly binary. It is, but there's also gradations, as we know from the numerous grading systems that we have in clinical practice. Uh, so I pulled an example here of a large pleural effusion versus a trace pleural effusion. And if we we're using a kind of binary label to train our AI, we would be telling the AI model that these are the same thing. Um, and they're both pleural effusions, which is true, but they're gonna be handled differently in clinical practice. And we want our neural network to probably think about them differently. Um, and they're also will have different uh, impacts on how we think about image resolution. I'd be pretty confident uh, at looking at this portal fusion at a relatively low image resolution. I, I, if I just had to say normal or abnormal, I'd probably be comfortable giving, getting four pixels uh, on each side. But uh, this, we can imagine a uh, model performing really well, even if we model at relatively low image resolutions. Now for this trace right, Portal fusion, which you might have some trouble seeing on my Zoom uh, screen right there. This, we're going to have to kind of think about the problem of image resolution a little bit more carefully. Um, we're, and we're probably not even going to want to assign the same label in our data set unless we're doing a regression or we're doing a further qualifier as another label, uh, because this is dramatically different uh, both clinically and from an image feature point of view with the exception that yes, the cosmetic angle is blunted in both cases. So uh, yeah, I'm just doing, making sure you can see it at home with this picture and showing how patches can be useful in AI. So even if we're trying to only constrain our images to be, you know, say 128 by 128 or 224 by 24, we can still sample the image and, and get patches. This is pretty commonly used in many different types of AI modeling. Uh, the vision transformer network that I mentioned uses patches of images in its conversion of an image to an NLP type model framework. Um, and also in mammography, this has previously been employed quite frequently because as we saw from that previous slide, mammography is where we're using the highest um, amount of spatial resolution for our images. So we're most gonna potentially wanna have our AI models able to zoom in on the images for mammography as a modality. So an important consideration with image resolution is gonna be pneumothorax, but unfortunately in the paper that I mentioned at the top of this talk, I wasn't able to model pneumothorax and look at the ramifications of image resolution in pneumothorax. And that's because it's important to kind of keep in mind confounders when making AI. Uh, you're when you're giving a model inputs, if you're training it, let's say with binary uh, cross entropy as your loss function, then you're not really telling a model, you know, I want you to tell me whether this is pneumonia or not pneumonia. You're telling it, I want you to tell me whether this is a zero or a one, and it has no context on that. So it's free to take any parts of the image and any features considerably in the image associated with the labels you've given it and kind of use those to make decisions. And in the case of binary cross entropy, it'll become confident on things that it should not become confident about in terms of associating those labels and saying zero or one. And so a great example of this is actually with pneumothorax in that, you know, here's a pneumothorax, no chest tube, patient needs a chest tube. Uh, and then here's another one with some clay preprocessing, and they have a chest tube. So the good thing is that you know, ED docs, uh, docs on the floor, uh, in the wards, ICU, they're great at recognizing the pneumothorax and treating the patient, giving them a new uh, chest tube for the pneumothorax if they need it. Sometimes this can happen before imaging. Uh, and even if it doesn't happen before imaging, what will often happen is they'll have imaging before the chest tube's place, and then they'll have a lot of imaging after that. And so if we're not careful with how we're labeling our data set and how we're preparing our data for training with a neural network, we can have a case where we're not training a pneumothorax model, you might think we're training that, but what we're really training is a chest tube recognizer model. Because as you can imagine, if I go through a data set of images and every time I see a chest tube, I say pneumothorax next, uh, I'll actually probably perform pretty well. Maybe better than if I'm looking at low resolution images and trying to make out a trace apical pneumothorax. So this is a really important concept to keep in mind uh, in the idea of confounding features and images, especially for medical applications. Uh, another kind where it's kind of uh, 
uh, what I've kind of seen to happen to me personally in my life training, I was training for cardiomegaly. Um, and my model was recognizing really strongly whether or not they had an ICD. Uh, because as you might imagine, patients with cardiomegaly frequently have cardiac rhythm devices implanted. Um, so it was kind of embarrassing when the neural network that I trained was very confident um, that a patient had cardiomegaly when they did not at all. Um, they've had uh, congenital cardiac anomalies that, that then had corrected surgery. Um, they still didn't have cardiomegaly, even though they had an abnormal cardiomegastinum, uh, but they had an ICD in place. And so the model said with very, very strong certainty, very high confidence, this is cardiomegaly. Um, and the reason for that is they had confounded the idea of an ICD with the idea of cardiomegaly. It was just being told zero or one. It didn't have any kind of word context in that training paradigm. You could obviously get more complicated and train word contexts into your labels, but that wasn't what I was doing at the time. And that's often what's not done uh, for training. So this is an important idea to remember. So going to the paper and the results, uh, we have this image now, which I'll use to compare performance in terms of area under the receiving operating characteristic um, for different models trained at different resolutions and well, in this context, I wasn't training them as a multi-label output, which would be more convenient, but I was training as a single binary network. So rather than tell a neural network with a multi-label output, tell me whether or not these 10 things all may or may not be in an image. I am then instead training on only one thing being in an image. So it's a little more restricted of a training paradigm. And I'm going to ask you to ignore the hernia curve, and I'll explain why in a bit, but we can kind of scrutinize this a bit closely and look um, at how the curves kind of flatten out over time, which is partially not completely, you know, divorceable from how I actually train these models and how I was going through the training process, but it is illuminating to me to kind of see how quickly we get to our kind of plateau performance uh, with these these models and which ones are pretty good uh, right away, even on 32 by 32 pixel images uh, like edema and kind of even atelectasis, and then which ones really need more time like emphysema before they can start getting to their plateaus. So we'll go to a table now, and the reason why I wanted you to ignore hernia completely there is because I probably should have excluded it from the paper, uh, but I didn't for completeness sake. However, the number of hernia cases in that NAH data set that I was using is very, very small compared to the number of other positive samples. So for emphysema, we had over 2,000, same for cardiomegaly. Uh, we had almost 12,000 for atelectasis. For edema, we have over 2,000. For effusion, we have 13,000. For masses, we have almost 6,000. Same for nodules. But for hernia, we only have 227. And for the purposes of this paper, I want to train everything the same. Uh, but the problem with that is if we're, I was using a cross entropy loss function with weights um, for the asymmetry between the number of samples in each group. So the problem with that is our loss function becomes very heavily weighted. Uh, and I was also using the same total number of samples, so 20,000. You can get much better performance if you shrink this and use transfer learning. So this is why it should be in because there's a much better way to do training. Um, in this case, but I was just trying to be consistent with how to train well for these other uh, more represented labels. Uh, but the loss function here is 87 uh, for the weight that I was using, uh, and that's just far too heavily weighted. There's far too much asymmetry in the class samples that I was trained there, so it's not a really good model to look at. But casting aside the bad model to look at, there's some good models to look at, or, or at least useful models to look at. So what I find really interesting is kind of how well we do at 64 by 64 pixels uh, for our image resolution compared to 320 by 320. And again, 320 by 320 is still very small for how large the images were, how, what their image resolution was as they were acquired. However, it's comparable to how we do a lot of training. As you saw from when I was talking about Chexpert, that's how the images are given to you for Chexpert. It's pretty frequently used at least historically, you know, you don't use huge image sizes or huge image resolutions for neural network training. Now, as we get bigger, deep, bigger uh, amounts of memory on our GPUs, more easily accessible GPUs for doing parallelization, 
that very well might change in the future, and it's kind of difficult to predict. I, I certainly would have predicted the recent uh, vision transformer network architecture breakthrough. But looking kind of historically at this concept, it's useful to compare uh, what we do at a very low image resolution and then what we do at more of what the kind of more standard neural network training paradigm was and kind of see where the disconnect is. So for emphysema, there's a huge disconnect. Um, that's a much more kind of uh, feature that benefits from having better spatial resolution in your image. Uh, cardiomegaly, uh, pretty well as well, but as we kind of mentioned before, uh, things like edema and effusion, really, uh, they were doing pretty well already uh, in terms of their performance. Uh, nodule, not so much, though. And we'd kind of expect this disconnect between nodule and mass that we see here, uh, simply because, you know, masses by definition are larger than nodules. So uh, I think I'm going to show this a little better. Uh, you know, emphysema, you, it, admittedly, emphysema surprised me a little bit initially, uh, because, you know, if you think about kind of hyperinflated lungs, that is kind of a very large scale feature. But the actual kind of interstitial uh, findings are much finer. And that's why the neural networks definitively benefit from a higher image resolution for that feature label, or diagnostic label, I should say. And so we can kind of visualize this another way with this chart, which is going to be showing um, the 32 by 32 pixel ORAC performance in green, the 64 by 64 ORAC performance in black, and then the this is all percentages of the maximum performance in terms of ORAC that was, well, not the max, the true maximum, the 320 by 320, what I was kind of using as like a plateau point uh, across those images, even though the true maximum varied. So in any case, we can see here that edema was really good for both 32 by 32 and 64 by 64. Uh, same with atelectasis. Uh, effusion had a huge jump, from 32 to 64, which you might kind of imagine because we think about those different sizes of uh, portal fusions that we can have. Uh, once we can kind of see it um, in terms of the blunting, that's where we kind of start having better performance. Um, mass and nodule both still had that offset that we saw earlier. And then emphysema was doing pretty poorly for these. Same with cardiomegaly. So, um, just to kind of see some pictures of pulmonary edema to kind of help contextualize these ideas and think about them with the images. So here are some kind of, you know, cases that have been labeled moderate pulmonary edema uh, in data sets. So I'm tempted to go through lots of these types of cases where I show a uh, diagnosis label, show cases related to that diagnosis label, and then kind of deep dive into the implication of image resolution for that specific diagnosis label. But I also really want to get to part four of this talk. So instead, I'll simply recommend thinking about this type of concept whenever you're reading chest radiograph cases, or if you're training your own AI, then I'll make the classic plea to look at the data. Uh, look at the radiology data that you're using uh, for your training validation uh, data sets, and think about what image resolution is likely most suitable for your application. Um, so I'm going to beg you to not try to use 224 by 224 uh, resolution images if you're making a CNN to detect trace pneumothorax. Uh, and I'll also uh, recommend considering that if you necessarily want to have the same uh, label uh, for your data sets uh, for a large tension pneumothorax that uh, desperately needs uh, some kind of intervention like a chest tube, or a small apical pneumothorax that's self-resolving. So uh, not only is image resolution kind of important from a practical point of view, but I also think it's uh, rather useful for contextualizing uh, what our labels mean uh, and what our labels might mean in a clinical setting. So there's one more uh, subject I'd like to touch upon briefly before part four, and that's the idea of using this kind of low resolution uh, versus high resolution thinking for dose reduction. So in radiography, uh, arguably you could, uh, we're talking about more of your input 
tensors uh, for an AI when I'm talking about kind of low spatial resolution images. But if you only need low spatial resolution images for an AI and you were in a future setting where AI was the only thing looking at the images, then you could almost certainly consider um, dose reduction on the acquisition side of things um, if you're not going to need it in the analysis part of phase of your clinical setting. But for radiographs specifically, this probably isn't the right modality to be chasing this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there's a study by Laham et al. Uh, that was kind of just quantifying how many millisieverts their chest x-rays were, um, and their average AP chest radiograph dose was about 0 0.14 across their institutions that they looked at. And so if you compare that to CDC dose data about, you know, that you get about 0 0.035 millisieverts dose when you take a plane ride from Los Angeles to New York, then you're only uh, getting four times that for an AP chest radiograph. So you do one round trip uh, trip from LA to New York uh, in the summer and then one in the winter, and that's basically your chest radiograph dose. So if you're really trying to get the most bang for your buck in terms of dose reduction, when you're thinking about AI using a possible lower spatial resolution for analysis than a human reader would be comfortable with, a radiologist, then you'd probably want to be looking at other modalities. Um, and then even though MRI doesn't have kind of ionizing radiation dose, you could still potentially think about, you know, decreasing your scanner time needed if that's a limited resource where you're practicing. So there definitely are interesting implications of this in terms of dose reduction or decreasing scanner time, but I'm just going to caveat that that I wouldn't really argue that radiographs specifically where I've spent the most time analyzing this are the modality to chase dose reduction in with this technique right now. But it's still interesting food for thought. And that brings us now to part four, which is going to be a brief code walkthrough. Not necessarily the uh, code that I used in that paper I mentioned at the top of the hour, but uh, another set of code uh, that I wrote recently and was part of my 2020 virtual RSNA poster presentation, which has a GitHub repo. So as kind of a brief kind of practical point, uh, I always think it's kind of interesting to know what kind of setup people are using. So what I was using for this GitHub repo that I'm about to share is I had just one of my local home computers. I just used a single 1080 Ti GPU, which had 12 gigabytes of RAM. I personally like to write in Python and I like the Anaconda distribution. I was writing in Jupyter Notebook um, for the GitHub repo I'm about to go through, but I've also used Spider a lot in the past. Um, and I was using PyTorch and FastAI for that. So now let's go to GitHub and I'm going to share my screen and walk through a GitHub repo. And I'll apologize in advance that my current GitHub profile is a little bit barren. All right. So in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and skip down past the import statements and a lot of the pre-processing that I was doing in this notebook on the MIMIC data set. Uh, this might make the review of code a little too rapid to be useful, but the goal is going to be to emphasize that the setup is still relatively straightforward. So the pre-processing that I just scrolled past was all to set up a function here uh, that will take a keyword phrase as its input and then retrieve a list of images uh, associated with the radiologist reports that have that keyword phrase within them. It also spits out a pandas data frame. So now we'll skip down some more in the interest of time to where the meat of a lot of our setup is for the neural network with the fast AI library. So right here we have a set of image augmentations that we're going to do to our training data, uh, which we didn't really discuss much in this talk that's okay. Next, we're going to set up an image data bunch in the past AI library. So we just have a path. We have a list of names that we set up with our pre-processing that has all of the images we want to use for our training and validation based on how we've set this up. Uh, we've got a list of our labels. Um, the way I was talking about it in the talk, uh, we are going to use uh, binary labels or class labels. Uh, here, uh, this is a regression application. Uh, we want to predict how where the endotracheal tube is relative to the trina in this particular notebook. So this is, are actually floats. 
in any case, here's the percent of the data that we're going to use for validation. It's particularly small here. Then we have a random seed for this uh, validation set extraction. We have the batch size, which we talked about being very important during the talk. And then here we have our image resolution, which we can change, and the image augmentations that we had above. So as you can tell, picking an image resolution is kind of one of the main parts of our setup. Over here now we have the architecture that we're going to go with, in this case a DenseNet 121, and our loss function, which since this is a regression application of convolutional networks, it's going to be mean absolute error, but if we are doing classification, then it'd be something akin to cross-entropy. And that is about it. Uh, with this minimal kind of setup, we are ready to train. We just need to pick a learning rate, which we can actually find a learning rate in a more sophisticated way if we wanted to, uh, but that's a topic for another time. Uh, and Leslie Smith has some great papers on that. And we pick the number of epochs we want to train to. And then we're ready to go. This is kind of a fake setup in a way because I've only kind of set the number of epochs to a very low number. Uh, and the learning rate hasn't been kind of picked in a sophisticated way. But it still demonstrates the point that uh, this isn't something we should be intimidated by if you're perhaps new to train neural networks yourself. Uh, there's a little bit of coding background required, but this is pretty easy to get into. And uh, if you haven't started training neural networks uh, yet yourself and are watching this, then I would strongly encourage you to do so. All right, well, that is a wrap on the code walkthrough, and that is a wrap on all four parts of this talk. I'm really excited to have gotten a chance to do this talk today, and I'd be really excited to hear more from all of you who might have watched it. So feel free to email me at my email address here uh, to talk about this talk, uh, any of my publications that you might have read, or just talk about AI in general. And I'd also be happy to set up a Zoom if you, know, you want to have a more detailed talk that email doesn't necessarily suffice for. So thank you again, and have a nice day.